Chelsea Crown. Welcome to Worship Here this day. Go ahead and have a seat for a few announcements. We are so glad you're with us as we continue on in our series, Unraveled, seeking God's help when plans fall apart. And we've been talking these last few weeks about being unraveled in lots of different ways and how God's grace comes to us even in those times. Happy Independence Day as we celebrate the 4th of July and the birthday of this country. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the sermon today and how we as Christians can understand this day and our, our country and both celebrate our country and also look to its improvement so that we can more closely align with God's values. We have some new sign-up sheets that are out in the narthex, and if you're unfamiliar with that word, that's a very churchy word for the lobby. <laughs> so we have some new sign-up sheets. Uh, we really do need everybody's help as you feel called and as you pray to God to give you direction in how you can best help our worshiping community. But since we're a small-ish church, uh, you know, we would like people's help with reading and assisting in ministry and being an usher and a greeter and all kinds of things. So if you can please look at the sign-up sheets on your way out and maybe pick one or two spots where you can help out and sign your name, that would be really helpful. We are still not passing the offering plate around because we're still being super cautious about this whole COVID thing for a little while longer. So we have the offering box out in the narthex. You can just drop your offering in. Also, we're still collecting funds for the technology fund where we have the matching grant from the Pacifica Synod, and we're very, getting very close to that. So our goal is to raise $5,000 toward technology. The Pacifica Synod will then match that, so then we will have 10,000 to go toward screens and cameras and a better um, live stream system and all kinds of things because we are now in this new era of being church. And so we wanna be able to keep up with all of that. We are in our YouTube channel where we're uploading videos. We are touching lives as far away as India and France. We know also it's all around the United States. We get calls and connections from people all over. So we're doing a whole lot more than what we do in this building. And that's because of the technology we have and, and how amazing that is. So thank you for contributing to that as you feel led. Today we do not have a Bible study because it's the 4th of July. People have different plans and things that they're doing. So we will resume our study uh, in Romans next week. I want to give a special thanks to Brent Twominen for leading worship last Sunday. He's an excellent preacher, and this congregation is so lucky to be able to have Brent step up and give his gifts, share his gifts to the community. So thank you so much for doing that, Brent. That was a great sermon. If you haven't heard it, it's on our YouTube channel. Speaking of our YouTube channel, we are very close to 400 subscribers, which is super great. So please tell your friends and family to please subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. But pass the word around. It just gets more of a gospel out there in the world. Tomorrow, um, I will be doing the Coffee with Pastor at Starbucks between 3 and 4 in the afternoon at the Starbucks on Day Creek and Baseline. So if you'd like to come on out there and grab a drink with me, we can sit and chat about anything that's important to you. Or if that doesn't work out and you want another appointment, just give me a call or reach out to me or talk to me today after church, and we can make another appointment at a more convenient time. The young adult group will meet tomorrow at 6 p.m. here at the church for Bible study and pizza. So if you are a young adult, and hey, as I always say, you get to self-define <laughs> if you define yourself as a young adult, then come on out and let's have a good time with pizza and, uh, and Bible study. Thursday on Zoom, we have the final book study for Beckins. So if you uh, just check your email, you'll get the invitation to that. Saturday, I'm leading a presentation for the women of the ELCA titled Healing Religion's Harms. So if you or someone you know or love have been harmed in any way by destructive religion or toxic religion, um, which is, you know, my definition is, you know, just religion done badly. If you feel bad, um, then that would be you or somebody you know. Religion is so powerful, so it really can be uh, used as a weapon, unfortunately. So if you have been harmed by any kind of religion, then check that out. If you're on our email list, you should get the Zoom link to that. If you don't have that, then get a hold of me and I will forward that to you. Next Sunday, after the congregation meeting, which I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit about in a minute, but afterwards, uh, we are going to have the, uh, the Romans Bible study. Oh, and then during the worship next Sunday, we get to meet some of the Indonesian congregation. So we have two other congregations that are renting out our space. I don't know if you're familiar, but the Korean congregation, I believe they're Presbyterian. Am I right about that? <laughs> Methodist. Thank you, Methodist. And then, uh, and then also an Indonesian congregation that is ELCA Lutheran. 
So some of the Indonesian community will be here next Sunday, and then some of their choir members are even going to sing a song for us, which is really great. Those are the announcements I have. Anything else? Oh, okay, just a reminder that next um, week after church, from about 10.15 to 10.45, we'll have our congregational meeting here. And I think that's it. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> oh, also we're collecting pasta in July for the food pantry. So please bring on out as much pasta as you feel called to do so. That's it for the announcements then. And you are so, you are so welcome to be here. I'm so glad you're here. Now we're doing things a little bit differently. We're passing around uh, communion. Hopefully you already got a little packet of communion. It's not the same thing where you're walking up and receiving it up here in the front quite yet. But after you do receive communion, if you'd like to go by the candle and say a prayer over here on the side, that will be lit for you to do that. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Please listen to the call to worship. Listen, I have a story to tell, a story of a God who longed for justice, a story of a God who pushed back the waters to make dry land, a story of a God who would not take no for an answer when it came to the safety of God's own. For God's people were suffering. God's people were crying out. God's people were shackled and bound by oppression. So God said to Moses, speak, let my people go. And Moses spoke over and over again. Moses stood up for justice, but over and over again, Pharaoh said no. Power said no. The path to justice is never easy, is it? The path to change is never a straight line, is it? So, like Rosa, who sat on the bus, and Martin, who had a dream, Moses kept trying. God kept speaking. Moses kept listening. Hope kept breathing. And when power tried to unravel justice, the people kept dreaming. God longed for justice. God still longs for justice. So let us worship God, for human injustice will never be strong enough to unravel God's dream that all might be free and all might know love. Let us worship holy God. Amen. We worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I invite you to stand now for a time of confession. God, you've asked us to be like Moses, standing up for your people, standing up for justice. But all too often, we are like Pharaoh, holding on to power or holding on to privilege. God, you ask us to be like Aaron, who stood by his brother to unravel systems of oppression. But too often, we align with Pharaoh, saying no to change and unraveling your vision for justice and peace. Forgive us for all the ways we stand on the wrong side of history. Forgive us for the harm we do to your planet and for the harm we do to your children. Help us to be like Moses. Forgive us when we're like Pharaoh. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us. And, in, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. By his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of love. Today we gather and pray that you would unravel our bias, unravel our assumptions, unravel whatever it is that keeps us from you. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and it follows along with chapter 7, verses 8 through 23. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should heed him and let Israel go? 
I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Perform a wonder, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh in his officials, and it became a snake. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and they became snakes, but Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand by at the river bank to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that was turned into a snake. Say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. See, with this staff in, that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall be turned to blood. The fish in the river shall die, the river itself shall stink, and the Egyptians shall be unable to drink water from the Nile. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt over its waters, over its rivers, its canals, and its ponds, and all its pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout the whole land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and of his officials, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the river, and all the water in the river was turned to blood. And the river and the, and the fish in the river died. The river stank so that the Egyptians could not drink its water, and there was blood throughout the whole land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not even take this to heart. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand. The Holy Gospel in accordance to St. Matthew, chapter 10. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house of Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So, have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who will kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you in peace from God our Creator, Christ our Savior, and the Holy Spirit our Sustainer. Amen. Well, we're continuing on with this Unravel series, and today looks at when we, the people, when we unravel God's plan for justice. This just so happened to coincide with this national holiday, the 4th of July. I didn't plan for this particular lectionary text to be here, but I think it fits really, really well, looking at Moses and Aaron and his sister Miriam also, who's not mentioned in this part of the scripture, but as they lead the people away from the Pharaoh's grasp and into safety, into freedom. One way of understanding the Bible, and you know I just absolutely love to, to study it, and I think it's just a fascinating book. It's not a history book. It's a book that we can study forever, and our whole lives we can learn something more and go deeper into it. 
And one way we can open up the Bible to us is when you read a passage, when you read a story, to imagine yourself as each of the characters in the story and say, how am I like this person and this person and this person? Because our tendency is to see ourselves as always either the good person in the story or always the victim in the story. We rarely see ourselves as the perpetrator, the one who's doing anything wrong. And yet, we just had a confession because we know that we are saints and sinners alike. We're not perfect all the time or else we would be Jesus himself. We know that we do things wrong and we bring those to God in confession. And so it's helpful, I think, to look at the story, those who are doing things that are morally good, those who are doing things that are morally bad, and every character, and say, how am I like this person? It's a time for critical thinking. It's a time for thoughtful reflection. It's a time to say, how am I like the saint? How am I like the sinner? How, how am I like the victim? How am I like those who would victimize? But today, instead of looking at us individually, and saying, how am I like each of these characters in the story of Moses and the escape from Egypt? Let's look at it as, as the United States. How is the United States like each of these characters? Now, we might feel a little bit of anxiety there. What? It's okay to question the United States? Of course it is. If we're going to be thoughtful, intelligent, critical thinkers, we don't want to just be the kind of people that accept uncritically anything that a nation does. We want to be Christians first, and we do not want to worship our nation, no matter what nation it is. That would be literally the definition of idolatry. We want to worship God and God alone. So whether we are a citizen of the United States, Canada, Mexico, or any other country, if we're a Christian, we're asked to keep God as God and not the nation to keep the nation as a beloved place in our hearts, as a place where we're excited to celebrate its birthday or, or other important days, but to not say that the nation is necessarily infallible like God is. That's the difference between being a patriotic person and being someone who uplifts nationalism. Nationalism is a sin. Nationalism says that the country can do anything aligned with God's values or not, and we will necessarily say that it's good. We can't be like that if we're going to follow God, because sometimes the nation, whatever nation, will go with God's values, and sometimes it won't. And we're going to need to choose who our God is. And so let's be patriotic, and let's celebrate our country, but let's not worship our country, or be afraid to look at it with a critical eye and say, what have we done right, and what have we done wrong? We just did that in confession. Let's look a little bit further, though, in this story. First of all, the character of God. God values freedom. Yeah, it's obvious in this story, isn't it? God's trying over and over and over to get the chosen people, the Israelites, to go free after many generations of enslavement in Egypt. Now, the Israelites first went into Egypt because they were starving. There was a famine. And remember the story of Joseph, where Joseph and the Pharaoh stored up all these storehouses of food so they could feed the Israelites that were starving. So that was fantastic when they first went into Egypt, and they were greeted with hospitality, with love, with graciousness. That, we know, fits in alignment with God's values. How do we know God's values? Through Jesus. Let's not look at all of the Bible and all of the stories and everything that is written as necessarily being as strong of God's values as Jesus is. Because sometimes people talk in the Bible about how God tells the Israelites to go to war with the Philistines, and it says actually horrible things in the Bible, like dash the children of the Philistine children, dash their heads against stones. And we believe that was written because that was tribal warfare going on that was actually against God's values. We know God's values because of Jesus. Jesus would never say that about children, right? So we look at the whole Bible through the lens of Jesus Christ. Does Jesus value freedom? Yes. Jesus was always trying to liberate people, liberate them from their sin, liberate them from their shame, liberate them from feeling like an outcast, liberate them from their humility, 
liberate them from the social structures that were put upon them, whether they were women, children, Samaritans, lepers, tax collectors, and so on. We know that the greatest liberation in Scripture came from the cross. That through the cross, Jesus has liberated us from sin and death for all time. So clearly when we look at Jesus, Jesus values freedom. So we can look at this story in Exodus, the liberation of the Israelites from Pharaoh, and say, yes, clearly here it is again. And you actually see this all over the Bible. There are stories all over Scripture about how God is constantly trying and working in culture, in history, to liberate people. So then when we look back at the United States, does the United States value freedom? Yes, absolutely, right? We know that in our founding documents. Your ancestors and mine, unless you're Native American, probably came here because of the value of freedom. I know that my ancestors came from England, many of them, and in that situation, there were a whole lot of different kinds of values of freedom, but one of them was the freedom to have their own kind of worship. To be able to be in a place like this and speak the name of Jesus Christ and worship in the way that the conscience dictates and not feel afraid of being arrested. Not all communities around the world feel that way. In fact, that's why the Indonesian congregation that worships here came to the United States because of persecution in Christian worship in Indonesia. So in that way, we can say, wow, God bless America, we got it right. We value freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, all the different freedoms, freedom of religion. And we don't always uplift that, but at least we have the value. And I know many people have come here to this grand experiment that we call the United States. We're so young, we're still trying to see if it'll work. But we know people come to this nation because of that value. Let's look at the character of Pharaoh. How was the United States like Pharaoh? Well, that's a more uncomfortable question, isn't it? Because we want to say, well, we're just like the Israelites. We want to be free. We're just like God. <laughs> we want to liberate everybody. Well, we're also like Pharaoh. If you look at our history, we have not always been the kindest people in the world, have we? You know, when I was in elementary school in the 1970s and I heard about Columbus Day, and I heard about the pilgrims, and I heard about the country, I didn't hear in my little elementary school books about the genocide of the Native Americans here on this soil. I didn't hear about it. I mean, I saw the pictures in my elementary school books of the first pilgrims and the Native Americans sitting down happily sharing turkey that first Thanksgiving, as, as if they were best friends. But if you go on and study this land, this soil, Rancho Cucamonga, Corona where I live, and all over this nation, it was inhabited by people who were slaughtered. And those who were lucky enough to be kept alive were relegated to reservations which were the most undesirable places of this land and taken away from their sacred mountains and forests and rivers and lakes. We have been like Pharaoh. And then the African slave trade. I mean, it wasn't that long ago in human history. In human history, it was the equivalent of like five minutes ago when we bought and sold human beings, took them away from their homes and their families against their will, many who were brutally murdered in order to bring people here to be <coughs> slaves. And we cannot look past that history so lightly without a deep recognition of that, a confession, a repentance, dialogue, and reconciliation and reparation. We cannot just say, well, I didn't do it. Of course not, of course not. But my ancestors did, and my country did. And to be a Christian means I'm not always going to say that the country is God and perfect. To be a Christian means I'm going to say God is God and perfect. And sometimes we align with God's values and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we were like Pharaoh because we didn't want to give up our position and our privilege to let the people go. Moses as well. 
is in this story, and Moses is an amazing character. Gosh, so complex. He was an Israelite, raised by the Egyptians, then he murdered an Egyptian, then he escaped to the desert, then God told him, I want you to be the one to let my people go, but he had a speech impediment. We don't know exactly what that was. Maybe he was stuttering. We don't quite know. But he didn't want to be a prophet at all. He was trying to figure out who he was. Understandably, the poor guy probably had an identity crisis with all that he had been through, all that he had seen. Who am I? Am I an Israelite? Am I a slave? Am I an Egyptian? Am I a person of privilege? Am I a person that just needs to run away from it all and go to the desert? Am I a murderer? Well, he's kind of all of it. And now he's got what he believes to be an impediment which stops him from confronting Pharaoh, who wants him dead, and saying, I command you to let my people go. I mean, I'm sure he just thought, I can't possibly do this. By the way, most prophets in the Bible said that. I can't possibly do this. But God told him, you're not expected to do this alone. First, I will give you the words to say, God says. Secondly, I will give you people to help you. Aaron, your brother, who's a smooth talker. You know, siblings are different. They have different gifts. And Moses had the gift of leadership, but Aaron had the gift of speech. Miriam also is not included in this part of the text was also in his family, and she was enthusiastic, and she had incredible faith, and she was known for her Miriam song, who bu buoyed them up, you know, and who kept their faith going as they left the, the desert. So we look at Moses then, and he's a person who felt finally convicted to follow God and to do the right thing. When I used to teach high school, I had a poster in my classroom that said to the students, stand up for what is right, even if you're standing alone. Because we know how hard that is. We know how hard it is to stand up for the right thing when we're standing alone. It's easier to just go with the system, to go with the nation, to do what the nation does, to think as the nation thinks, to move as the nation moves. That's what's easier. And when we know that, we can know that by default, that's what we will be motivated to do. We will be motivated to do what everybody else is doing. But God says, Moses, I want you to do something different. To stand up for what is right, even if you're standing alone. Moses still had a conscience. He could still hear the voice of God, and he was called to act. Martin Luther King says, the long moral arc of history, or rather, excuse me, the moral arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. So sometimes we need to be patient, but it does bend. It does bend toward justice by thinking critically, by getting more and more refined as to how to treat people. And let's look at Aaron and Miriam in this story. How is the United States like Aaron and Miriam? Well, the United States values individualism. We each have our own little personal declarations of independence, and we want to have our own way of doing things. We're much less community-oriented than many other cultures in the world. We are more individually oriented. What do I feel? Who is Jesus for me? What is my goal in this world? What do I want to do and be? But God values community. And God didn't just call Moses to be an individual. He did need to stand up what's, for what's right, even if he was standing alone. But he wasn't truly alone because he had Aaron and Miriam, that support in the community. And we can remember, even as individualized, independent Americans, we can remember God's value of community and be there for one another. So when we see somebody going against the pull, the allure of the system, standing up for what is right, we can be there for them. We can support them. We can be their community like Aaron was, like Miriam was, and say to the Moses that's sticking their neck out, that's going to get attacked. That's what happens to prophets. We can say, I'm there for you. You're not alone. I do support you. You do have friends. I see what you're doing. And even if we're not gifted in the exact same way, or even if we're not called to do the exact same thing, at least we can show people that they're not alone, that they have support. 
When we look at the Bible then, when we see the stories of the Bible, the Bible is not a book for the ages to sit on a shelf or to even read once. Picking up the Bible and reading it and going deeply into it is like looking into both a newspaper of today's events and looking into a mirror. It's not about what happened thousands of years ago, because who cares, right? I mean, I'm sure lots of things happened throughout the world, and it's long scope of history, and it's over and it's done. But that's not what the Bible is trying to show us. The Bible is trying to show us parallel stories of what we are going through today. It's like looking at a newspaper. It's like looking at the internet and seeing what's happening now and the characters playing in the stories now. And it's looking in a mirror, saying, who am I in this story? Or who is the United States in this story? It's probably all of it in different ways. Or who is the church? Who is the congregation? Again, probably all of it. We are all saints and sinners, individually and collectively. But when we look at this incredible sacred text, we can see so much wisdom that will guide us because the Bible is God's story and the people of God are our people. It is a mirror of us today and now. So let this story of Moses and Pharaoh and Miriam and Aaron and God and all of the people, the people of privilege, the people of victimization, let this story be a cautionary tale for us today on the 4th of July in 2021. Let this story tell us to not be like Pharaoh, to not oppress people's freedom in any way, shape, or form. God does not want that for any of God's children. And let us be like Moses, acting boldly to say what is right, to work for liberation and justice in this land, to listen to people when they're in pain, instead of telling people they shouldn't really ought to feel that way, but to listen how people really do feel, especially if people feel in bondage. And let us more than anything remember who our God is. It is not Pharaoh. It is not Egypt. It is not the United States. It is not any system. It is God and God alone. We give God our allegiance. We give God our obedience. God alone is the source of our life, who gives us our conscience, who gives us our marching orders, who gives us directives. God is our hope. God is our goal for us and for all people. And God loves freedom. Let us act. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand.
We will now confess our faith with the affirmation of faith found there on the screen. I believe in God, the creator, who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who hems us in before and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ, who loved and claimed the people society had thrown out, refusing to disregard anyone as scrap. I believe God has woven part of God's self into the fiber of our being, making us inherently worthy of love and belonging. I believe the fabric of my life is weak, that I am prone to error and need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church and that like a quilt of different fabrics, she is designed to be as diverse and beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, to hold me in the palm of God's hand, to tell me of love, and to invite me into a new journey. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of all through the waters of baptism, you claim people of all races, ethnicities, and languages as your beloved children. Sustain the baptized and increase their faith, that your gospel may be proclaimed throughout the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of the heavens, your creating spirit animates the universe. We give you thanks for the moon and stars, for the planets and the Milky Way galaxy, and for all of the mysteries of the cosmos that remain unknown to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of freedom, you have liberated us from sin and death, and you have rescued us from all forms of spiritual, social, and political oppression. Defend us from tyrants in our midst, deliver us from all forms of slavery or corruption, direct our freedom for works of liberation and wholeness for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, you became vulnerable in the person of Jesus Christ, in solidarity with the disempowered. Strengthen those who feel faint, give courage to those who feel fear, bring wholeness to those in need, and especially today we pray for these United States. Bless all of the people here, bless all throughout the world that we touch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of holiness, you send us out into the world to proclaim your love. We pray for all of our outreach ministries here through Cross and Crown, through our YouTube channel, in our surrounding communities, and out, out throughout the world. Equip us as we leave this place to witness and serve our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please offer up any other prayers in your hearts. For all of the prayers, the people, and the situations dear to us, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks that in every time and every place, you call forth prophets who move us toward freedom. Moses, Aaron, Miriam, Rosa, Martin, and so many others. Thank you for all those who work for human rights, community organizers, and all who strive for liberty for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, our ordinary gifts seem small for such a celebration, but you make of them an abundance just as you do with our lives. Feed us again at this table for service in your name, in the strength of the risen Christ. Amen.
Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this, the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. Let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the bread and the wine of God for the people of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Go ahead and take off that first peel and receive the bread, the body of Christ given for you. And the second peel the blood of Christ shed for you. After you have received this, you're free to return to your seat, to listen to the music prayerfully, thoughtfully, or you're free to come up and light a candle and say a prayer. Oh, 
Please stand. May the body and blood of Christ keep you in God's grace and peace. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. And now receive your blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.